Mavericks wasn't supposed to exist. It wasn't supposed to be there. It was a mystery that it was just suddenly found in this area that's 20 something miles away from San Francisco. In Half Moon Bay, who's you know formerly famous for its annual pumpkin festival, it's as if they've discovered Mount Everest out behind Mount Whitney. Teenage surfer Jeff Clark grew up along Half Moon Bay's secluded coast, riding homemade boards in the region's powerful rugged waves, where he carved out a frontier existence far removed from surfing's mainstream. I was a freshman in high school, and you could see this place exploding from out behind the building where we'd all congregate in the morning. And I was with my childhood friend, and it's like, I had to go, Brian, we got to go check that out. We'd sit up on a cliff and watch this place go. And one day, it was like, Brian, today's the day. I go, bring your board. And he's like, there's no way I'm paddling a half a mile offshore to a place I've never been. So he sat here at the end of the cliff and said, I'll call the Coast Guard, tell them where I last saw you. The year was 1975, and the wave Clark intended to ride broke a half a mile offshore into a veritable graveyard of jagged rocks. The wave was considered more a navigational hazard than a surf spot. I just remember a wave jacking up. I'm in the vein and total commitment. If I eat it, I eat it, but I'm going. And I hit my feet, and I've never felt water pass across the bottom of a surfboard so fast, fastest I've ever gone. And I made it. And I just thought, man, I want another one of those. I am so stoked to be here. Thank you. I'm so stoked to be here. You know, Mavericks. It was right there in plain sight that nobody could see it. And then when my parents moved to the beach, I thought, oh my goodness, what is, where, this is good. This is really good. My relationship started with 100 feet from the sand, from here to the back wall was my playground. And I'm nine years old. The guys are out surfing out in front of the house, and I'm like this little gnat, curious as all get out. What are you doing? I'm checking them out. And they're like, kid, what do you want? I said, I want to, I want to be a surfer. Shoot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I was persistent, very persistent. Finally, one of them said, kid, here, I brought you a surfboard. I was like so stoked. Nobody ever gave me a surfboard. Now I had my surfboard every day after school, run down the street. Back then it was a dirt road. How many of you have lived on a dirt road? <laughs> okay, that was a while ago. <laughs> get, get home, get my surfboard, and go down to the beach. Once I lived at the beach, I found that the ocean changed every single day. The waves were different, the wind was different, the swell was different. Some, guy, some days the guys didn't show up, but I was still at the beach and I was trying to paddle out and one day I got caught in a rip and I'm getting sucked off the shore and there's no one around at the beach. And like they say, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. <laughs> and it was little experiences like that where I got better, I understood the movement of the water better and my passion grew. I actually started making surfboards at a very young age because it was, this guy had moved back from Hawaii, a big wave, not a big wave surfer, but a surfboard manufacturer. His parents lived in Granada, And uh, he goes, oh, kid, I'll help you make you a surfboard. And your mom's pretty hot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I didn't quite put that two together. I was a little kid. But, uh, <laughs> they started taking me surfing. I got better and better. And, and pretty soon I was surfing with the guys that were 10 years older than me and pushing it to a level of, of just, this is really fun. 
I'd have, yeah. along with the fun comes adversity. You paddle out in a, a big, uh, a bigger day than normal, and you know that anticipation, and you're a little, you're like a little apprehensive. I'm going to follow these guys out and just keep an eye on them, watch them, see how I do, and you know try and stay out of harm's way. Next thing you know, I'm getting drilled, and I'm underwater, and I'm holding my breath. Back to that lesson again, what doesn't kill you will make you stronger. And I got better and better at hanging with the, hanging with the older guys. Then I remember the first day we are surfing Ross's Cove, and it got too big, and I could see Mavericks. The first day I laid my eyes on Mavericks. When you see a wave like that, it's like, wow, that mountain, that mountain's in the ocean and it's moving and it's breaking and it looks like a really good wave. To give you some perspective, this, where those lights are in the ceiling, that's how big it can get. Okay, seawater, 1,600 pounds per cubic yard. So imagine this falling on you. Actually, a wave that big probably weighs the same or maybe even more than this building. So when you get drilled by a wave of barracks, my goodness, is it memorable. <laughs> there we go right into fear, right? Fear is one of those things that you have to embrace it to help you go to the next level. I, I, one of the ways that I've learned to combat getting drilled, because there's uh, checks and balances as you progress in your learning your skill, getting drilled, being underwater, you know, I tried counting, it's like, okay, one, two, three, one. let go of me, please. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it doesn't happen. And when you get real big waves, I learned to, you've all heard of panic rooms? Well, I got one right in the middle of my brain that's the size of, of a pistachio shell. <laughs> and man, oh really, this is how my day is gonna begin? <laughs> I run in there, close the door, and just like pushing sleep on your computer. I'm just gonna wait a while before I actually pay attention to ragdolling my body's going through. And it's like that dog that grabs that stuffed animal and just starts going like this. It just, there's no hope. <laughs> but finally, it's that you feel the bubbles start to let go and and the, the turbulence lets go and you, it's like, okay, it's letting go and you can start to feel the buoyancy and you start to raise to the surface and you're like, please let me get to the surface before the next wave breaks. And sometimes, man, you get to the surface and you go, bam, and you're down along for the rinse cycle one more time. Some of the things you learn how to do, I mean, I didn't have any trouble with just paddling out into it. I, I had a thirst for power and a thirst for adventure, and I was learning how to deal with all that along the way. I could not get Brian to paddle out there with me. And I was changing my wetsuit on the beach and putting, my, putting it on and getting my board ready. And I'm like, man, come on, you gotta go. And he's like, there's no way. So I, the whole time I was changing, I was watching and studying the way the waves are breaking in the reef and, and being able to kind of figure out what's my safest path to get to deep water so I can then paddle half a mile out to the edge of the reef where these big waves are breaking. I get in the water, I'm duck diving, I'm punching through these waves and I get to deep water and then I start the journey. The thought does cross your mind that, well, I'm in deep water, I'm probably not alone. You know, there's probably other things watching me out here. But I think over the years, well, they got used to me because I'm still here. <laughs> but I got out to the peak and I'm sitting there in the lineup and triangulating my position. This is a poor man's GPS. It's like, you learn this in scouts, right? There's a tree here and then a tree over there. Okay, that, um, that'll put me right there. And then a rock here and a tree on the mountain over there. So I was able to triangulate my position right at the end of the bowl. And then I started paddling up and over waves and watching the, watching the waves as they would stand up. And from what I learned, playing on the, in the tide pools, at high tide, watching waves break, and then at low tide, seeing what those waves were breaking over, gave me a really good understanding of 
why waves broke the way they did. So I'm watching these waves stand up on the reef at Mavericks and I'm studying the face of those waves and looking into, okay, that wave stands up and I can tell exactly where the wave is gonna break first. And I need to be there because that's my in. Go up and over a couple sets and then I'm in the right place and then I'm just spinning and going. And it's like when everything's right, it almost becomes an inv involuntary reaction. And you spin and go and you're just digging with everything you've got. You're swimming like there's a shark chasing you, <laughs> like almost walking on water. I mean, you're, and this wave stands up, I hit my feet, just like in the movie. Uh, I get away, I get away, I, I hit my feet and I'm dropping down and thinking, oh, this is good. I'm, going faster than I've ever gone before. And then the shadow, it's like, oh no, really? <laughs> this, is, this might really hurt. And uh, I get away and the explosion hits right on my heels and blows up behind me and I make it to the channel. And I start paddling back out and I start looking for another wave and I get another wave. And one of the things that crossed my mind was that we didn't really have big wave surfboards in California. Nobody believed there were waves this big. Hawaii was the epicenter of big wave surfing until Maverick showed up. We didn't have the equipment. I started shaping boards and, and even to this day, I'm still shaping boards for some of the best big wave surfers in the world and I'm still enjoying surfing Mavericks. Surfing Mavericks, Riding those waves, I realized that I definitely needed bigger boards to, if I wanted to keep going to another level. And it all started with when I first saw that wave and watching it and seeing myself out there, my mind could conceive me being there. I discovered looking back that I developed the tools that I needed, which was a mindset to go after something that was out of reach to everybody else. Said, you can't do this. Mindset, developed the skills to deal with the ocean, the most powerful thing that I dealt with, and then the tools. And it allowed me to realize the dream that I had to ride Mavericks, to ride that wave. I know all of you have something that maybe you want to do, but have never stepped off the edge to go do it. Mavericks was my way, and I hope that through some of these examples, you can find your way. Thank you.